So we can start by just introducing yourself to I'm, us. I'm Charles Redmond. Um, that's the name I was given with my parents. <laughs> uh, the, uh, way, uh, way back in 9, 30th of November 1963. Uh, and brought up between Dumarnock and Bridgeton. You know, wandered about the Clyde. You know, the Clyde was a big playground uh, as a child, you know, along with another, uh, along with a number of, of friends. And, uh, you know, it's been a big part of my life, you know. It's a, I mean, it's a tremendously important thing for the city from, you know, all the way to uh, kind of um, Grunick and back up to the, the, the Falls of Clyde kind of thing. But in this particular bit, in, you know, British and Dumarnock, Glasgow Green, British and Dumarnock, and I don't know where it goes up to Kenlachie or something like that. What, what is it? Kamayo. Kamayo, I'm sorry. I always do that. Um, Kamayo, what, what, what's people's relationship with the river, do you think? I think, I think it's been different over the years. You know, when I was a, a child, there was a lot of heavy industry mm. you know, along the climb, you know, engineering, steel, manufacturing. And it wasn't a place where it was attractive in terms of the way that it was polluted. But yeah. it's the yeah. decline of you know, the heavy industries. It's, it's become cleaner. You know, there's more activity around about it in terms of people, but there's also more activity. You've got deers and foxes. There's plenty of fish in it. In the, in the Clyde now, a lot of fishermen, um, cyclists, walkers. Uh, so it's, it's seen a lot of change uh, over the years. And, and, and essentially, probably about 25 years ago, that the, the kind of a senior stakeholders in the city, which would have been the council and Scottish Enterprise, um, realised how much an asset it was. Uh, and that's, I mean, essentially we got the games uh, the Games Village there uh, because we actually were able to demonstrate very clearly about the potential of, of, of the Clyde, particularly in terms of, you know, Dunmarnock and going up into Parkhead, the way it loops around. The big loop, yeah. It's a big loop. You know, I've, I, I swam there. I, I swam there and I told this story, but um, it wasn't for, you know, public viewing. I, I, I said I remember when I was a young boy, about 14, 15 year old. I was, I was swimming in the, the Clyde. And, and I say that people are shouting, get out of there, get out of there. And I'm saying, oh, I'm not coming out. And he said, do you not realise there's alligators in there? I says, it's okay, I won't touch them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you know, when, when all the, uh, the big power station was there and, uh, and yeah. Beardmore's and, and a lot, there, was, there was a lot yeah. of industry, wasn't there? Oh, my father worked in, in Lairds um, and when he probably worked there, there was a couple of thousand people working in there. Um, so he, my father was a miner. You know, left the pits, retrained, and became a printer and mm -hmm. worked for mm -hmm. Lairds. And uh, it was a big part of our life. I went to school, Strathclyde Primary, right next to the Clyde itself. I remember throwing my school bag in there. You know, they, they, they got the eye test and, uh, and they gave me glasses. And it was the, count, the council glasses. It's the kind of a worst, you know, set of glasses you can ever get. And obviously the, the name calling and stigma of wearing these poor, poor glasses. So I decided to throw my school bag in rather than just the glasses themselves. <laughs> and to my horror, a few days later, I was probably about eight or nine year old, somebody came to the door with it. the school bag back and you're like, oh my goodness, who is that? How could they do this to me? You know, take their name down, we will actually hold this against them for life, for the end of their life. So yeah, I mean, I, I say, I, I, it's a huge part of it, and I think in terms of the role that I've played here and as an elected member, you realise how much an asset it, it was. You know, it's the, the liquid gold of, of Glasgow, certainly the liquid gold of the East End. So the, 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 um, the reconstruction that went on around the Commonwealth Games is obviously a huge thing, and I imagine there's usually a, a bit of a carryover from heavy industry and so on, a lot of clearing up to be done, is that right? But the, the biggest problem we had in terms of the decline of the, the, the neighbourhoods, you know, like Parkhead, Bridge and Dumarnock, probably Oakland's to, to an extent, uh, and probably the Gorbals, is that the Clyde was the, the kind of a the doorstep of the residents, but it was also being piloted, mm. you know, by the, the industries that, that <coughs> surrounded that. And uh, the problem was that the, the, the contamination, Clyde Gateway was essentially formed to actually deal with the contamination because the land values were zero, zilch. Yeah. You'd have to pay people money to actually to buy them. Now people are paying close to £300,000 to buy a, a family home in the area. 
And it's great that that's happened because that part of Glasgow has given so much. You know, Parkhead, Bridgeton, Domarno, you even get Beardmores in terms of the, the World War efforts. Power Station in Domarno, where they, during the Second World War, the, the Germans were, were bombing it. Tried, there's two bombs uh, landed in Domarno. Uh, and, you know, it's it's gave a lot to, to, to the city. It's gave a lot to the west of Scotland and the country itself. So getting that investment back, has showed it's shown it's actually worthwhile. So you must be pleased then. I mean, the the progress. I mean, it's like so. It's nearly ten years since the Commonwealth Games, which I don't know. Sometimes it seems like a short time. Sometimes it seems like a yeah. long time. But but in 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 the bigger picture, it's quite a short time, really. And as you say, people have moved in, and whole new communities are being formed here. You must be very you must be very proud of that. Absolutely. You know, at the at the election, you know, someone comes in to vote at the the new school, and that there's a story in that itself. And and I'm looking at the person, I'm thinking, I know your face. And I'm saying, how is it I know you? He's actually um, one of the senior snooker professionals. You know, boy, Graham, Graham, no, it's not Graham Dot. I'm trying to think his name. But anyway, yeah, I think he, he's, you know, playing, I he's playing on the, 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 the tour, you know, and I think he was in the top 16. It's, I'm trying, it's, it's, def, it's no Graham Dot. McGill. Anthony McGill. Okay. So he's, he's in the top 16. And it's great that we're attracting people who would know the history of the area and probably the, the recent history, you know, in terms of the area's decline. So it's great that you're actually attracting people from all different walks of life. And I've been in, I've been in a lot of the houses uh, in the, the Games Village when they were under construction. I had, I had an interesting story. Somebody asked, to, you know, what, what was happening. And I said, well, I'll meet you. And, uh, and I met him and he says, I stay in that flat in there. And I said, I've been in your house. And he's like, why, why, when are you in my house? He's got a fright. You know, and I says, no, when it was getting constructed, they would take us up there because he had a great view, you know, so he was kind of a bit, a bit of a shock that I'd been in his house, but it was before um, he was, he'd obviously moved in, so it's great. Also the flats that are where the power station are, absolutely magnificent, and the people buying them first, I think they were paying about £125,000 for a two-bedroom flat, you know, where, with a... a, a a, a garden, you know, a rooftop garden that you can actually look, look right onto the Clyde. It is absolutely magnificent. The, the the next phases of housing, it's like we need to get the the retail part of it because there's a you know there is a local development plan, but there's no point in you know and I'm expressing this you know as as passionately as I could. There is no point in having these plans unless you're going to deliver it, you know, because what as a community it is about the retail sector. So you get shops. You've got businesses, you've got schools, you've got play areas, etc. You know, there's whatever. All of this makes it makes a community. But essentially, it's the people that make a community. But we need to give them resources because Castleville, yeah, and East Four, has the... forty thousand population. Way back, probably in the, the late sixties, early seventies. Bigger population of Perth, mm. but one mm. one pub or whatever. And yeah. it's a lesson we've learned in the city, isn't it? From from yeah. as you say, Castlemilk yeah. and Easter House is much the same. Yeah, I mean, I, my own background, I, I work for uh, social work. You know, so I was a community development officer working for social work. You know, working with tenants groups, community councils, and Dunmanock, mm. mm. and uh, and also a, a part of my remit was to set up a credit union. Essentially, it's a community bank, but the credit union. It covers the Marnock, which is BCD, which is Bridgeton County the Marnock, turns over about 12 million quid. You know, so 30, I think it's 30 seconds year we're in. So it tells you about how do we actually come together. And banking your money and allowing people to borrow it is a good way of doing that because the economic impact of the credit union is incredible. But sorry, going back to the real point I'm going to make, is that as a community worker, I was able to pick up the strategies the action plans as an elected member and put them into place. So you were ready and you knew that, well, I knew if, if, if you've got, you know, people on board, if you've got, you know, a, a, a plan, I think then it's important that you actually, you share it with people and that plan becomes, you know, part of, of their plan, you know, so, and that's, and that's essentially how we kind of, uh, you know, got a bit of momentum, the, the national Indoor Arena, which is now the Emirates Arena. Huge, yeah. Huge. Getting that was really, that was that was a huge thing. That was a real thing that kicked it off, and it happened by accident. You know that I became aware of um, the the government at the time, the Scottish government, looking at indoor sporting facilities. You know, and they were wanting to create a national one. 
and we came up with this. Frank McAvee, he was the sports minister at the time, and I had the, the economic development role in the council, so we were able to, you know, bring that together. Why shouldn't we? You know, um, why shouldn't we? Because everything's local. No, there's no point in me being, you know, a, a, a good elected member for the city and not actually delivering in your own backyard, and mm. that's always been my focus. You know, that's, that's been the focus. Do you think the East End is different from other parts of the city? I mean, I, I, people have said this to me, right, you know, about, you know, the East End, but you know, that's through the East End way. I think it's working class people. Uh, okay. I would say that people in the North, you know, in the working class communities in the North, and your Springburns and mm -hmm. your Mountains mm -hmm. and Postal Parks, you know, yeah. they're, they're not much different not much from different. us. You yeah. know, and I think there is a, but there is clearly, in terms of geographical terms, an East End. It's easy enough to, to kind of a group that, whereas I'm not really sure in other parts, you mm. know, how, the south side, if you think, it's massive. Yeah. You know, the West End, you know, there's people think they're in the West End. Usually when they're trying to sell their home, they think they're in the West End. As a Actually, they're in Mary Hill. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> we, when Bridgeton was the first to get the, the benefit, you know, because Glasgow Green, you know, we knew that the park, you know, would, would I think we spent about £17 million in Glasgow Green between maybe... 2002 to 2005, you know, the Homes for the Future, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Bridgeton then became, it, it extends the city centre towards Bridgeton. So they, they get a benefit from that. And, you know, when people are selling their home, it's East Merchant City or <laughs> Glasgow Green. So, I mean, quite right, quite right. But a bit of, of the, you know, if, the, if you look at the dynamics of the area, Glasgow Green, you know, the, um, the, the Clyde, these are, these are all huge, and it's about how do we how do we make them? Because you know, I, I think when I was young, it was always a place to stay away from. Whereas now, it's, it's that's not not the case. But it's how do we turn it for a liability into an asset? You know, talking about the decontamination of the of the land, and it takes a lot of hard work, and it takes a lot of keeping that message. You know, there's a core message about that, and essentially, it's about you need to invest in people hmm. from the east end of Glasgow, whether it's up in Park Keds, Shelks and Toll Cross, <coughs> all the way back down to Dunwarmock. You need to invest because if people, people always react, you know, it's the carrot and stick. We're going to react much more to the carrot than we'd ever to the stick. Not that anybody likes a stick. Just, just going back, back to your youth, I mean, you were talking about school and, and playing in the river and so on. Um, We've, we, you know, I, I didn't grow up here, so I have no kind of skin in the game, but there was, there were some rough times, weren't there? I mean, there were... Hey. Very, you, you know, know, you had to look out for yourself. Absolutely. I mean, there's a gang culture, you know, which I think it's starting to kind of a dying down a bit, you know, within Glasgow. But it's easily, we'll, we'll raise it head again if we don't, you know, make sure that we manage it and give people positive destinations. But growing up here, you're very much aware of the gang culture. There's probably about half a dozen gangs at least in the Bridgeton area. To this day? No, not, not to this day. There's, I didn't even know if there's one gang no, left. Exactly. But when yeah. I was growing up, you know, it was like there was a number of gangs within particular areas and particular streets and parts of it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's the, in Bridgeton, the, the, the gang it's well known as the Bridgeton Derry. You know, and uh, growing up in school, you know, as people come from different areas, etc., you've also got that passed down. Yeah, yeah. You know, the family's passing it down. Etc. So, but was there a way in which sometimes, if there was an outside threat, that the, those those rivalries would be put aside and people would come together? Of, of course, sir. definitely. Um, the 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 community will always come together when there's that wider threat, you know, to to them and the, the families that live here. You always look after your neighbour. If you know, you always people would be intervening. You know, there's great stories about stuff that, that's, that's happened to you. Some that I probably wouldn't go on record on, you know, in terms of the... Oh, go you know, on. When, when, you, when you're talking about the, the kind of a... the madness of the, the kind of a... Um, the, what is it? The paramilitaries, you know, from uh, Northern yeah, Ireland when it's yeah. kind of a creeping in here. But there was always that bit where it was kept to, to a minimum because the... And I wouldn't say it's gangs, the big families. The big families always determine what's going on. And they weren't there for it. They were definitely no for it in terms of the paramilitary stuff, you know, where it was a UVF or UDA or 
or whatever, there would definitely, there would be a, you know, there's a place for you, you know, but don't, you don't have that nonsense seeping into the, the wider community. And that's, that's what happened. I was very much, you know, told to stay back from it. You don't go anywhere near that. Or there are people who are involved in it. As a kid, you know, it's not as if you would, uh, you would, you know, but your parents, you know, would definitely be on top of you about some it's of the stuff. A, it's, yeah. it's, it, was, it, was, it was certain pubs in, at Bristol and Cross, but the, the, say the bigger families in the area, they would always, you know, they talk about community policing. They were, that was real community policing. You know, I mean, I've had, you know, I've had some telling offs and I know I couldn't go to my mum and father and it was like, you behave yourself. I had a, a situation years ago, I was working in a youth club and somebody came in and uh, I've asked a young boy to leave and uh, the father then comes up. We are drinking him, you know, and it was, it was a bit mad. So eventually <laughs> we get him out as well. So I was a bit annoyed about it, really annoyed about it, you know, so they're expecting repercussions. The, the, his brother-in-law comes to see me. I'm standing at the corner, Muslin Street and Reed Street, and he said, George, come here, I want a word with you. And he says that. Actually, it happened earlier. He says, I don't want you going anywhere near my, you know, my, my sis, that's my sister, don't you begin to deal at the door. And I said, well, I don't know about that. But I was about 16 year old. He says, you don't know about that? Mum will go up and see your dad. Mum will go up and see your dad then. I said, well, just leave it. That's where it's ended. <laughs> so you couldn't, you couldn't deal with right. us. I mean, this was mental. This was somebody who had a weapon, you know, come up and you're like, oh my goodness. So, um, and I'm, to be fair, but I've got nothing. See, the, the person that came approached me, the, the, the brother-in-law of the person, I had nothing but respect for him. And it's a thing, and probably even a bit of love as well. You know, it's a thing that working class people don't talk enough, enough about, about love. You know, we, we, they, we do love, you know, people and, and, we, and it's that affection. You know, there's things that happen. You, when people pass, pass away, there is bereavements. The community come out in force, you know, and they'll actually support them. You know, and, it's, and there is that expression of love. And I always think, we should probably tell them, why don't we tell them what we think about where we're here? Two or three weeks ago, we had a Robert Murdoch, who was, uh, he's worked in the centre for nearly 40 years. We had a retirement do for him, and we gave him the tributes there and then, which I think is absolutely magnificent, and rightly so, because he's, he's served this community. He's served this community in a way that very few people have, and to do that is absolutely magic, for not just for him, but his family, because usually when they do that, they're in Dogdowie. Right, you know, yeah. And I, and I just think in terms of bereavement, there is an expression of love when sometimes we probably need to express it more, and it's just sometimes working class people, you know, they put on this, you know, persona that it doesn't really matter when, no, it does, you know, it, it, it does, you know, and I, if I started to tell you things about my I'd be crying, you know, about my own mother, you know, and I had a, an, you know, a situation with her where, I t you know, you're telling each other how much you love her, and you know, the, the, that is, it's something where I'm really, really proud of myself, and I'm proud that I had that relationship with her, I'm proud that I had that moment with her, and uh, and, I'll, and I'll never forget it, and I've got it for the rest of my life, you know, where um, she, she, when they're lying there, and I know it's long to go, it's easy to say you've got that outpouring of emotion to tell people at the prime what they mean to you. Mm. I think that's, uh, uh, that's something we probably need to do much more of, but we need to encourage it and, and, so, and probably normalise it to an extent, and I think the situation with Robert is... is it's a good one, that, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I swore at him as well. Yeah. Smashing. <laughs> Listen, George, that's fantastic. That's exactly what we were hoping for, so a kind of portrait, a passionate portrait like that. It's just brilliant.